The Chinese Air Force repeatedly encroaching on Taiwan. Taiwanese jets warning off Chinese jets that approach the island for the eighth time in two weeks. Chinese netizens suspect China's largest dam has discharged floodwaters without alerting areas downstream. This says heavy rains trigger surging floods upstream. In China, every aspect of one's life is monitored and controlled. So what's life like under a communist regime? One Beijing resident tells us more. And the Trump administration gives 48 hours for a Beijing-linked radio station to stop broadcasting to the U.S. through a Mexican station. The case revealed how communist propaganda was able to circumvent U.S. laws to reach American audiences. A lawmaker is trying to close that loophole. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Now to Beijing. We recently reported the situation in Beijing may be much worse than the official reports indicate. Judging by comments made by an official from Beijing CDC this week, the city situation appears to be worsening. The official provided information about the movements and whereabouts of 12 recently confirmed patients. Strangely, several of the patients had no contact with Xinfadi Market, the origin of Beijing's second virus wave, nor did they have close contact with other confirmed patients. In this case, prevention measures can't do much, and transmission from one person to another may be uncontrollable. A new virus case has also drawn attention. A food delivery driver was confirmed to be infected. But before his diagnosis, he delivered around 50 meals every day and covered many districts of Beijing. As a result, it's difficult to judge how the driver may have impacted others. Beijing has enlarged the scope of its virus testing. In addition to all people who are in direct or indirect contact with Xinfadi Market, people from the clothing sector, catering industry, delivery and logistics must also be tested. In areas with a medium to high level of infection risk, people from transportation systems, supermarkets and banks must also be tested. For those who live in a surveillance state, every aspect of their lives is controlled. In Beijing, people are monitored no matter where they go, on the streets, in taxis, and even on the phone. One Beijing citizen told us her story. To protect her identity, we've given her the pseudonym Miss Yang. Miss Yang recently ordered a car via a ride-sharing service similar to Uber. While driving, Miss Yang saw a group of policemen on the street. She mentioned it to the driver. But the driver reminded her not to speak negatively about the police, adding that it's better not to mention the word police at all. That's because everything inside the car would be recorded by video and audio surveillance. All footage is immediately sent to the authorities, who can use software to help them to identify sensitive words in improper speech. But what's considered improper speech? The driver told Ms. Young that it refers to scolding people with dirty words, bad comments about leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, and information about the virus epidemic that doesn't fit into China's official narrative. So what happens if the customer or driver crosses the line? The driver said he would receive a warning message from the authorities. Even the choice to wear a face mask or not can be a problem. The driver told Miss Yang that she was alone in the car the other day without a mask. Then she got a message from the authorities reminding her that she must wear a mask. But where are the cameras and audio recorders located inside the car? The driver told Miss Yang that the driver's cell phone is used. It's a simple system. When a customer uses a ride-sharing app to get in contact with a driver, both of them have to accept many terms and regulations, including video and audio recording. If they refuse, they won't be granted access to the software. For months, medical teams from all over China traveled to Wuhan to offer their help. Moving stories about these people have been widely spread by Chinese media. The health workers put their lives at risk to help others. But at the same time, the Chinese Communist Party is using them to divert people's attention away from the regime's mishandling of the pandemic. CCP propaganda department urged official media outlets to produce warm news with positive energy. They then began to produce pandemic frontline heroic stories and stories of CCP's powerful execution. Here's one such case who was made into a figure in their propaganda stories. She shared her story with Europe-based magazine Bitter Winter. 
She was sent to Wuhan from another place for support as a medical staff. It's been two months since she came back, but still she has no peace. Monitored by government staff, she is busy telling her stories in Wuhan to designated media outlets, promoting positive energy. Her articles are later revised by propaganda personnel to publicize the party's achievements. Plus, she has been put to talk in endless meetings for the same purpose. Late January, her hospital ordered her to support Wuhan. She had to agree to avoid punishment. And the hospital leader made her say in media interviews she was going voluntarily. If I refuse, I will be punished and I will no longer be able to get promotions or raise. In Wuhan, she witnessed insufficient supplies, poor quality PPEs, death tolls were covered up. But she is not allowed to talk about them, even with her family, because these are considered negative energy. She said once you do, you will be charged for leaking state secrets. She concludes our futures are in the hands of the government. We can only do as the CCP says to secure our future. The Chinese regime tightened speech control during the CCP virus pandemic. Internal documents we obtained from the Cyberspace Administration Office of the CCP of a northern Chinese city reveal that the CCP monitors people's online speech every single day. The CCP cyber police keep a close eye on people's reaction to the internet buzz and delete any comments considered bad for their image. One March 24th document shows what kind of topics are considered taboo. The first thing on their list is messages about the CCP virus that are different from the official narrative. An example the document listed is a comment from a user on the online platform Weibo. That user was accused of posting so-called pandemic-related fake information. The internet police of that city found him out immediately and went to see him and warn him. His post was deleted. And as many global leaders and experts question the virus figures coming out of China, a new report has emerged. It was published by American think tank RAND. The new report uses air traffic visualizations to shed new light on virus transmission data. Researchers at the nonprofit combine case data from Johns Hopkins University with data from the International Air Transport Association. Back in January, before China imposed lockdown measures on Wuhan, about 5 million residents left the city, traveling to all corners of the world. Researchers used air travel data to map out where they went. They then pinpointed the five countries most at risk, Japan, Thailand, South Korea, the United States, and Taiwan. According to China's official virus numbers, the rate of infection was one confirmed case per 8 million residents. Judging by those numbers, none of the five countries should have been impacted, since fewer than that number of people traveled there. But virus cases were already being reported in all five countries at the time. For the number of virus cases appearing in those countries to match up, China would have needed around 40 times more cases than what was officially reported. That would mean the country had around 18,000 cases total by January 22nd, instead of the 500 China reported. As tensions continue to rise between the U.S. and China, another development, this time in space. China completed a space project decades in the making Tuesday, putting the final satellite of its Beidou navigation network into orbit. Beidou, the Big Dipper in Chinese, is an answer to the U.S.-owned GPS. Beijing began developing it in the 1990s, a way to help wean its military off of U.S. tech. China has previously said the system will keep military communications secure and improve weapons targeting, especially in the Asia-Pacific region. Beidou also has major civilian applications. More than 70 percent of mobile phones in China were Beidou-enabled as of last year. Millions of taxis and buses already use Beidou signals. And Chinese state media have said the satellite services are in use in about 120 other countries. Many of those nations are involved in the Belt and Road Initiative, leader Xi Jinping's signature efforts to link China up to Asia, Europe and beyond with large-scale projects. The launch was broadcasted live on China state-run media CCTV along with English translation. It's a rare move as China usually only broadcasts after a successful launch. The launch was pushed back after a week ago. According to the official Beidou website, there was a technical issue with the rocket. 
The launch serves to help Beijing expand its military and global tech influence. China's Beidou system is in competition with the U.S. GPS system. Russia has its GLONASS navigation system and Europe has the Galileo system. Russian and U.S. officials met this week in Vienna to discuss global security issues, in particular the expansion of a nuclear arms control treaty. President Trump has repeatedly called for China to join the talks. China, estimated to have about 300 nuclear weapons, has repeatedly rejected Trump's proposal. U.S. officials said China was hiding behind a, quote, great wall of secrecy. Two Australian mining firms made breakthroughs last week. Australia is hoping to separate its rare earth supply chains from China. One of the firms received government approval last week for the construction of its new project. The other firm will receive funding for its lithium mining project in Spain. Estimates say China controls over roughly 60 percent of global rare earth production. Rare earth is widely used for computer, cell phone and weapons production. Chinese netizens are suspecting that China's largest dam has discharged floodwaters without alerting areas downstream. The speculation comes as the dam's upstream regions see surging floods from heavy rains. NTD's Juliet Song has the story. A video circulating online accuses one of the world's largest dams, the Three Gorges Dam, of releasing floodwater without notifying regions downstream. This video can't be independently verified. Authorities in Hubei province, where the dam is located, said on Monday over 400 reservoirs were overloaded and are discharging flood water. The report didn't specify whether the Three Gorges Dam is one of them. No reports in local media could be found saying if the dam has discharged flood water. The Three Gorges Dam is built on China's Yangtze River and located in the central Hubei province. Chinese authorities see the dam as a political feat, while critics argue it is of poor quality and is at risk of collapse with the ongoing downpour. Regions upstream of the dam are seeing surging floods. The southeastern Chongqing is struggling with the worst flood in 80 years. Videos circulating online show the flood submerging buildings and washing away a house. A local told us many residents have never seen a flood of this scale in their lifetime. The flood submerged the bridge. Sichuan province, next to Chongqing, also issued a second highest flood alert Tuesday. Local Ministry of Water Resources warns residents to be alerted and watch out for potential danger. The heavy rainfall that triggered the flood on Tuesday hit a new high. Water inside the Three Gorges Dam Reservoir rose six feet above the warning level last Saturday. Flood water discharge without an alert could be disastrous, a local resident in the downstream region recalls. The flood discharge she experienced wasn't from the Three Gorges Dam. It was in the morning. Many drowned while they slept. Later on, the flood came down. There's silt everywhere on the roads and in shops on both sides. When people cleared the silt, they found people who had died and were buried inside the silt. She said many died, but authorities never reported the true death toll. Reporting by Chen Hang and Juliet Song, NCD News. In what appears to be a show of strength, Chinese bomber and fighter jets have been repeatedly encroaching on Taiwan's airspace. China's latest flight above the island marks the eighth time in two weeks. China's Air Force has ventured into Taiwan for the eighth time in two weeks. Chinese fighter jets, including at least one bomber, entered Taiwan's air defense identification zone on the island southwest. The encounter comes as Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen, oversaw a test flight of a new trainer jet. The aircraft, developed in Taiwan, is part of her plan to boost domestic defense in the face of growing challenges from China. The United States is the largest supplier of Taiwan's armed forces. A sale approved by the State Department last month granted Taiwan heavyweight torpedoes worth close to $200 million. The U.S. Senate also introduced the Taiwan Defense Act in recent weeks. The bill aims to strengthen Taiwan's ability to fight against possible invasions from mainland China. China claims Taiwan as its territory. Beijing says the air drills near the island are routine and designed to show the regime's strength. Yet democratic Taiwan has shown little interest in being run by autocratic China. 
The State Department is cracking down on Chinese propaganda outlets operating in the U.S. They're adding four more to the five already designated as foreign missions. The U.S. State Department designated four more Chinese state-run media outlets as foreign missions, identifying them as propaganda organs of the Chinese Communist Party. The move applies to China Central Television, China News Service, the largest newspaper group in China, The People's Daily, and its English-language affiliate, The Global Times. This makes nine outlets in total, adding to five that were designated in February. The decision doesn't affect what the media can publish. The State Department says it simply recognizes them for what they are, increasing transparency for Chinese state propaganda in the U.S. But the outlets will be required to register their employees and U.S. properties with the State Department. Meanwhile, the Federal Communications Commission ordered to stop a radio station broadcasting Chinese-language programming into the U.S. The Mexico-based radio station has ties to a pro-Beijing media outlet but hadn't disclosed this information. The FCC denied a license to the radio station, giving it 48 hours to halt its broadcasts. Critics sounded the alarm that the programming could allow Beijing to air propaganda in Southern California's Chinese community. The undisclosed ties are to the Phoenix Radio, an affiliate to Phoenix TV, which was found to be fully controlled but not directly owned by the Chinese regime. Senator Ted Cruz applauded the FCC's decision, saying that Phoenix TV was waging information warfare from a radio station across the border in Mexico. Phoenix TV has come under question before for their pro-Beijing stance. It's revealed that the media company with ties to Beijing was able to promote their narratives to U.S. audiences by circumventing U.S. laws and lying to regulators. It's not the first time Phoenix TV has been in the spotlight this year. In April, the outlet went viral after President Trump questioned its reporters' background at a press briefing. Who are you working for, China? You work for China or are you with a newspaper? Who are you with? Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Who owns that? China? It's is it owned by China? Hong Kong. No, is it owned by the state? No, it's not. It's a private-owned company. Okay. The president's question came after the reporter, before asking any question, made a long statement about how much medical supplies Chinese companies sent to the U.S. Phoenix TV was founded by a former Chinese military propaganda officer. The outlet calls itself a Hong Kong media. Yet public record shows that in Hong Kong, the station operates under a non-domestic television program service license. A 2019 report by the Hoover Institution at Stanford University said Phoenix TV is fully controlled by the Chinese government. For years, Phoenix had been trying to broadcast in Southern California, but wasn't able to do so because of an FCC regulation blocking radio broadcasters with more than 25 percent foreign ownership. But the outlet found a way around the rule. In 2018, a New York-based investment firm, H&H Capital Partners, bought a Spanish-language radio station in Mexico and switched it to Chinese language. The Mexican station is only 10 miles from the U.S. border and reportedly reaches 600,000 Chinese Americans in Southern California. At the time, the owner of the station denied having any ties with Phoenix TV. Vivian Hua, a Beijing native and naturalized U.S. citizen, owns a 97 percent stake in h h She said in 2018 that h h purchased the radio station itself, and the deal had nothing to do with Phoenix. Radio Free Asia reported that Hua previously worked as a New York financial correspondent for Chinese state media Global Times. And her Chinese name is indeed listed as the author of several Global Times articles covering Wall Street. In 2018, the Mexican station posted a job opening on Phoenix TV's social media account. The contact information is Phoenix TV's HR email. The FCC said the Mexican station's programs are actually created by Phoenix TV. U.S. Senator Ted Cruz, who in 2018 unsuccessfully tried to get the FCC to block the license, said that H&H is completely enmeshed in Phoenix TV's operations. Cruz proposed a bill this April that would prohibit the FCC from granting broadcast licenses to companies who buy radio stations with the intent to change the language of the programming, unless the FCC can certify that the programming of the station will never be influenced by a foreign government or governing party. In a statement on Tuesday, the senator said that Congress should pass the bill and put a stop to schemes such as the Phoenix TV for good. 
The State Judiciary Committee discussed ways to hold the Chinese regime accountable for its cover-up of the CCP virus outbreak. The chairman, Senator Graham, asked if civil lawsuits in the U.S. could proceed against China under the current law. Experts argue that diplomatic and economic measures may be the best way to punish the regime for its mishandling of the virus. Demand the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Senators and legal experts met on Tuesday to discuss ways to hold the Chinese regime accountable for covering up the CCP virus pandemic. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham chairs the Judiciary Committee. He suggests the U.S. should consider whether new tools are necessary to prevent what he calls devastating and deadly behavior from the CCP. We also know that China failed to inform the world about the nature of the virus, that they restricted travel into China but allowed Chinese citizens to travel throughout the world. They knew it was human-to-human transmission, and they failed to adequately informed the WHO, in my view, and the world at large. Uh, the bottom line... Missouri and Mississippi have sued China, saying the regime concealed information about the initial outbreak of the virus, which has caused their residents harm. Senator Dianne Feinstein, a Democrat, says this claim needs to be looked into. Pandemic. And let me say, this is the one thing that I think we really need to look into. Was information, in fact, quote, concealed, end quote? On December 30th, Chinese doctor Li Wenliang shared a report of a SARS-like virus with his medical school classmates on WeChat, warning them to take precautionary measures. Two days later, a Hubei health official told a genomics company to destroy all existing samples of the virus. Later that week, local police called in Dr. Li Wenliang and reprimanded him for rumor-mongering when he blew the whistle about the virus. President Trump signed legislation last week sanctioning those who oppress Uyghur Muslims in China. An international law professor suggests that Congress consider sanctioning China even more. Uh, You could uh, give the president further guidance in the types of sanctions you would like to see him impose, as you've done uh, with the Uyghur Human Rights Act recently. And I think those types of levers are the ones that are much less likely to boomerang back uh, than the one that, that your colleagues are proposing here. Experts have cautioned against taking away China's immunity to allow lawsuits against the country because China may retaliate against the U.S. with lawsuits of their own. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. Business activity in the U.S. hit a four-month high in June. It reflects the lifting of lockdowns and hope that America's economy is roaring back to life. According to the newest Purchasing Managers Index, or PMI, survey data by IHS Market, U.S. business activity showed a sharp rebound in June. All four measures tracked in the survey showed significant improvement. The Flash Composite Output Index, which tracks both the manufacturing and services sectors, rose to a reading of 46.8 last month from 37 in May. The PMI measure for the services sector, which accounts for some two-thirds of the U.S. economy, rose 46.7 in June, from 37.5 in the prior month. The manufacturing output index rose to 47.8, from 34.4 in May. And the PMI measure for manufacturing, which accounts for some 11 percent of America's economy, rose to 49.6, from a reading of 39.8 in May. Economists polled by Reuters forecast the manufacturing PMI rising to 47.8 in June, so the actual figures exceeded expectations. With all PMI measures, a reading below 50 indicates contraction in private sector output. But despite all four measures of business activity coming in below 50 and so contracting for a fifth straight month, the pace of decline of activity eased substantially and came in above expectations. This supports the view that the pandemic-driven recession is drawing to an end. And with New York City entering phase two of easing lockdown restrictions, more hair salons are starting to reopen. Many people have been looking forward to getting a haircut again. But how much is a haircut really worth? For some, clearly it's much more than for others. Nothing could keep New York resident Susan Warren away from her favorite hair salon on Manhattan's Upper East Side when it reopened on Monday. The visit is not quite what it was before the lockdown since temperature checks and masks are now required. Also, the client's purse is put inside a plastic bag for the duration of the stay, but none of those measures nor the steep $1,000 price tag prevented her from returning to the hair salon. It's worth every penny because it's so easy to take care of. 
and to me, nothing makes more of a difference in your appearance than your hair. So you feel like a million bucks. But obviously, not only Susan was awaiting the salon's reopening. Since all hairdressers in the city were closed, people couldn't get haircuts anywhere, and it showed. We have a huge wait list. People have been calling, emailing, sending texts. I mean, it's been nonstop. And not only the clients were waiting for the reopening, the workers themselves also wanted to get back to work and do what they do best. 1,200 people on the waiting list. So be back is like, when can we go back to work? That is a reality. So finally today is like, yes, we're alive. The salon is expected to be busy for the coming months. The CEO said they will be fully booked all the way into fall. And we have some good news for the U.S. housing market. Experts are predicting a dramatic comeback as long as unemployment is under control. America's housing market is poised to weather the pandemic and stage a robust rebound. This is according to a new Reuters poll of over 40 housing strategists. They believe U.S. house prices are likely to rise faster than prices of consumer goods both this year and the next. Experts predict house prices will rise 3% in 2020 and 2021. The Federal Reserve expects consumer price inflation at 0.8% this year and 1.6% next year. Managing Director Brad Hunter at real estate advisory firm RCLCO says he sees housing demand coming back in dramatic fashion. The Reuters poll comes on the heels of a survey by the National Association of Realtors, or NAR. It found that existing home sales in May fell by nearly 27 percent year over year. That is the biggest annual drop since 1982. But NAR chief economist Lawrence Yoon said the sharp drop in May sales reflects the height of pandemic-related lockdowns. He believes the housing market bottomed in April and is poised for a solid recovery. Fueling the housing market rebound are record low mortgage rates and housing undersupply. The average 30-year mortgage rate hit a new low of 3.3 percent this month. And Census Bureau data shows that new residential housing permits are down nearly 9 percent compared to May of last year. Still, in a sign of an economic upturn, new building permits saw a 14.4 percent rebound off April's lows. According to Lawrence Yoon, new home construction needs to ramp up even faster. Otherwise, home prices will rise too fast and hinder first-time buyers, even at a time of record low mortgage rates. Most of the experts polled by Reuters said the chief risk to a sharp housing market rebound is high unemployment, which now sits at 13.3 percent. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. Don't forget to like and subscribe for the latest updates and see you tomorrow.